So you see that we have a very advanced set of those commands. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any room. Yesterday, we were busy for that. The room that our class is usually there uh, is, is, is occupied for, for this time. We tried to find another place for that, but unfortunately, we couldn't find it yet. But Professor Sinatra is still working on that, contacting different people just to be able to keep some place. And it's not just a place, we should also find someone that you know, handles the camera because in the class, uh, probably have noticed that there is a buyer just sitting just in the front room and he usually handles the camera. So we need also that person to do that. And that's why it's necessary. difficult. But uh, yeah, we try to use this camera because we realized that uh, for this class, the video of the board was not legible <coughs> last time. And then so I'm going to upload my notes after today's meeting, but you know, just for those who want to watch the video and try to understand the materials, I think this is better, better than that camera. Okay, we will, uh, as I mentioned, we will continue with the projection theorem uh, today. So the projection theorem let uh, first any questions? By the way, we uploaded homework three yesterday and the two day is next Friday. Let B be an inner product space. In a product space, it's a vector space that we define in a product. And Let S be a subspace. Subspace of B. We have an inner product space, we have a subspace for that. Fix B. Fix B that belongs to this vector space, the product space, and consider. Following problem. This is the problem. And our search name is the subspace S. So this is our problem. I'm going to denote it by star because later on we will refer to this uh, this problem, and then I don't want to just write the problem several times. So whenever I say that in the problem star, I mean this problem. So it's an optimization problem. So we want to find an infimum of this node. In other words. Wish to find an optimal approximation I'm going to denote by S hat. So S hat is the solution for this optimization problem. So we wish to find an optimal approximation S hat to be in S. So that's the problem we want to pursue today. So before continuing the problem, here we have two small modes. Not necessarily for this problem, it's silent for any optimization problem. We say that the optimization problem optimization problem. 
star does not give me a solution if the infinite So this one again. Okay. Say that so. So in that case, for this star, uh, this hat is. And please note that for an optimization problem, we may have only one optimal, we may have several optimals. So this is not necessary, this is not only about this optimization problem for any optimization problem. If uh, we can find the infimum, it can be minimal uh, externalization in general, and we want to minimize or maximize whatever. If the minimum or maximum, the infimum or supimum is achieved, we say that yeah, it has a solution and the solution is optimal. Otherwise, we say that the optimization problem doesn't have to be a solution. Okay, any questions? So now we start the projection third. It has uh, three parts, and we are going to prove each part separately. But first, I want to mention the third, and then we will see how we can prove it. A. Suppose the optimization problem. Star is solvable. When I say it's solvable, it means that it meets a solution, there is an optimal solution. Then S hat is optimal. If and only if if double f b minus s hat is orthogonal to s. Furthermore, the optimal vector. S hat is unique. So 
So part A has two subparts. The first one it says that S hat is optimal if and only. So when we want to prove it, we should prove necessary and sufficient conditions separate. And then it says that the optimal vector is unique. So we should also prove its uniqueness. B. Suppose S is complete. Then star with the optimization problem is solvable. So what's the definition for a complete vector space? Who remembers? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's closed, I know the limit. Every convergent sequence. Every Cauchy. Every, every Cauchy sequence converges to the same vector space. Okay, part A, part B, and Part C. Suppose S is finite dimensional. Let B be one. Let's set B. Bn Bf basis for S and define the matrix M, which in general belongs to. C n minus n. It's a square matrix, but we define M as follows the inner product of B1 and B1, the inner product of Bn and B1, the inner product of B1 and Bn. And the inner product of the and the end. So we know that the inner product is a real number. So this is n by n matrix. Then m is non singular. Who knows what does it mean? When we say a matrix is not singular. Any idea? A non singular matrix is a matrix whose determinant is not zero or is invertible. Moreover, star is solvable. And the unique solution is given by S hat, which is the optimal solution, sum over I from one to N. Alpha i, b i, where I'm going to write alpha i here. There, alpha one, alpha n is n minus one. Product of B1 and B, 
So this is the projection theorem. It has three parts. We are going to prove each part separately. But before doing that, just remember, this is the optimization problem we are going to solve. So whenever I say the optimization problem is start, I, I mean this optimization problem. So it finds the optimal approximation of V in vector space S, capital S. So it's, it's very similar, or actually it's, it's the same, this is your problem. You will see this in, uh, in optimal control in machine learning or any other, other things that are based on this optimization problem. Probably you have seen this theorem in other courses or you will see in other courses because it's, it's kind of the basis theorem. And uh, today we are going to prove it. The main reason that we want to prove it is that because in the proof, I hope to give you some idea how we can prove uh, expressions or arguments in this form, then you can use those ideas in other courses or in the homework for this course or any other lemma or theorem that you wanna prove. That's the main reason we wanna prove this because I I'm sure that it will give you some ideas. Okay, so before starting to prove any questions on the theorem, And if any part is not clear, don't worry because in the proof we will see what each part is. Okay, so what is the proof? Yeah, so the proof is I'm going to leave the term there, there, and then. So then, uh, when I'm proving, you can just refer to the uh, to the. Third. Whenever you have a question, please stop and ask a question. So we start with part A. So this is true. Part A. So it says that first S hat is optimal if and only if V minus S hat is orthogonal. The subspace S. Let S hat be optimal. We will show that V minus S hat is orthogonal to S. So that's the hypothesis, and this is the goal we want to reach. We will use, uh, there is a method to prove, uh, there, there is a method for, for proving things in mathematics, in math. Uh, it's called prove by contradiction. So you assume that this is your hypothesis, and we say that we want to reach this goal. But you, you assume the contradiction, you assume that no, it's not true. Then you will end up with a contradiction and you say that, okay, so it's true. So here, suppose not. When I say suppose not, it means that suppose that V minus S hat is not allowed to S. Let's see what happens. I e, or that is, there exists. Another vector like S1 that belongs to S such that the inner product of S1 and V minus S hat is equal to alpha, which is not zero. Then we say a vector is orthogonal to a set of vectors, means that is orthogonal to each element in that uh, set. So I just and then we assume that no, it's not true. I just pick up an element from this S and let's see what happens. 
and I assume that the inner product is not C. Define beta, which is alpha over square uh, norm of S1 square. And the vector S2 equal to S hat plus beta S1. This is a subspace. So this vector should also belong to S. It comes from the definition of the subspace. Observe that the norm of B minus S2 squared is equal to, I just substitute it here, B minus S hat minus beta S1 squared. We know that when we say this is a norm, norm squared, so we need the inner product. So this is the inner product of B minus S hat minus B S1 and B minus S hat minus B S1. So again, from the properties of inner product, is the inner product, let's say this is one vector, this is another vector. So it's the inner product of the first, this one and this two, this one and this, and this one and this. So I write it in this one. It's the norm B minus S hat squared plus norm B S1 squared minus the inner product of B minus S hat and beta S1. Minus the inner product of beta S1 and B minus S1. So look, we have defined that the inner product of S1 and B minus S1 is equal to alpha. So I'm going to rewrite this in the following form. I keep the first two terms. For this one, it's minus beta alpha bar, which is the final bit. Because we assume that they are from the complex uh, complex domain, but if they are, they are just the real vectors, so this bar minus beta bar alpha bar. Another step here B minus S hat. I'm going to use another property is the absolute value of beta squared norm of this one squared minus beta alpha hat minus beta hat alpha. So from this, I have alpha equal to beta S1 S1 from this. If I use here, this term will cancel out one of them. 
and they will have only one here. So it can be written in this one v minus s hat square minus so one positive they cancel out one negative and they have only one negative minus absolute value of theta square no not this one square. Is it clear this step? So I just use this quality. Just uh, I put everything there and it gives me this. So here we have the left side is a positive value. It can be zero, but it's non-negative. Let's see. This is non-negative. Here we have another non-negative term, and this is for sure negative. So I can say that. This is lower than V minus S hat squared. Because I have a positive value here and I'm sub subtracting something from that. So for sure, the result is lower than the main positive value. Okay, what we showed here is that we showed that v minus s2 square is lower than v minus s hat square. So what does it mean? It means that we find another s which this norm is lower than the optimal. So it means that this hat is not optimal because we find something that gives us a, a, a lower value. So which shows that this hat is not optimal. This Our Korean that B minus S hat is more powerful for this. So the hypothesis here was that S hat is optimal and B minus S hat is orthogonal to the vector space S or some space S. We, we assume that, okay, let's assume this hat is uh, optimal, but uh, V minus S hat is not orthogonal to S. Let's see what happens. And we ended up with this inequality that says that S not is not optimal. So this is a contradiction. And since we reached a contradiction, it's, uh, it means that the, it means that when S hat is optimal, then V minus S hat should be orthogonal to Yes. Any questions? Sorry, I'm going, I'm going to, to raise the parts because we're going to keep that there and there because you can easily look at that. And, and we only have two boards here. So I have to raise. Can you explain why from uh, line to from this to this? Yeah, two to three. Okay. So we might not from this to this. No, no. from this to this. Okay, so look, we had it here that the inner and the, that the inner product of S1 and B minus S hat is equal to one top, which is not zero. We pick a uh, vector from S and we assume that since it's not orthogonal. So it means that the inner product is something, it's a value. So the inner, this is just the properties, V and alpha S1. And this is again alpha, sorry, it's the alpha. This. We had a property for the inner product, which was saying that 
any product that B and alpha omega is alpha to the inner product of B and omega. This is one property. The other property was that so one property was alpha and omega. The other property was B and omega in the product of B and omega was in the product of B and W, W and B, but it bar. So I use these two properties here. I say that this is alpha. So when I have the inner product of B minus S hat and this one, it's alpha bar. So this alpha bar comes from there. And this beta is just like this one. This is the property, so please don't, don't confuse the alpha here and the alpha there. It, it, it's just a property of the inner product. I'm using these two properties to reach or to expand these two terms. Is it clear now? It's if and only if. So first we assume that it's optimal. We showed that B minus S hat is orthogonal to S. And now we should prove the reverse. We should assume that B minus S hat is orthogonal to S, then we should prove that S hat is optimal. To prove the reverse. Let S hat be any vector that satisfies B minus S hat or how about S. Not necessarily optimal, it's anywhere. We will show that. S hat is up. So here, this is our hypothesis, and this is our hypothesis. For this, exam, S is, a, is an arbitrary vector. So I have one S hat and another S here. These two vectors are just any vectors in vector space S. So I'm going to expand this expression here. I add S hat and I subtract that. So B minus S hat plus S hat minus S. So it's, it's clear that these two uh, norms are equal. So I just add a stack and subtract that. This is equal to, again, I'm using, I'm going to use the same argument here that you're trying to ask. ask the question. So it's the inner product of V minus S hat and S hat minus S is the inner product B minus S hat plus S hat minus S and B minus S hat plus this again from the definition. 
Excel scores that are going to make that problem. So, in a product of one vector plus another vector is these in a product of the first vectors, in a product of the second vectors plus the first and second, the second and first. So, it's in this form. In a product of the first vectors, on the square plus the second vectors plus the inner product of a minus s hat and s hat minus s plus the inner product of s hat minus s and a minus s hat. Okay, S and S hat are two random vectors from vector space S. Again, by the property, we know that any combination of two random vectors from a vector space belongs to that vector space. Note that. S hat minus S and S minus S hat belong to S. This is the property of the vector space or the subspace. If you pick any random elements, any two random elements, their sum is a kind of sum also belongs to the, that, that subspace as well. So S minus S hat belongs to S and S minus S hat. So S hat minus S belongs to S and S minus S hat belongs to S. Look at the property here. When we say V minus S hat is orthogonal to a subspace, it means that it's orthogonal to each element in that subspace. And since these two are elements of this subspace, so it means that The inner product V minus S hat and S hat minus S is equal to zero. And the inner product S hat minus S plus V minus S hat S hat minus S and V minus S hat is also equal to zero. Is it clear? Cool. So Thus, we have V minus S hat, V minus S, the norm of V minus S squared is equal to V minus S hat squared plus S hat minus S squared. Again, this is a non negative value, this is a non negative value, and this is a non negative value. So, this is for sure greater or equal to B minus S hat S squared. Because this is a positive value. And if I'm not going to add this positive value to another positive value, the main positive value, so this, the left side will be greater than the first term here. Is this clear? Okay, what does it mean here? We pick just two random vectors, S hat and S, but S hat satisfies this, uh, this property, V minus S hat is orthogonal to S, and we prove that the norm of V minus S squared is greater than the norm of V minus S hat squared. It means that this norm is lower than this norm. So since S and S hat were just random vectors, so it means that S hat that satisfies that property is lower than any vector because S can be any vector. So 
S hat is the optimal one because it gives us the smallest node. This is correct for any or for all S belonging to the subspace S. This notation means for all. This implies that S hat is up. Is it clear? Do you have any questions? So part A, the first one was S hat is optimal. If I know it, B minus S hat is optimal for S. We prove the necessary condition and then subtraction condition. And now we should prove that optimal vector S hat is unique. So we have a solution and that solution is unique. The uniqueness of the solution. Finally, we will show the uniqueness of the optimal vector. S hat. For this, let S hat and S double hat both. So when, when I say that it's unique, so the best way is assume that okay, it's not unique, and we, I have another optimal solution, and let's say what happens. So it's, it's again kind of contradiction. Then U minus S hat is one cardinal to S. We just proved it there that if it is optimal, it should be all cardinal. This vector B minus S hat should be all cardinal to S. And since we assume that there is another optimal solution, which is S double hat, B minus S double hat should be also all cardinal to S. So then B minus S hat is all cardinal to S and B minus S. Double hat is also common. Now, examine. S double hat minus S hat. So let's see what happens if we consider the norm of S double hat minus S hat is correct. So this is the inner product of S double hat minus S hat and S double hat minus S hat. Again, here I can add and remove one element just to the first vector. I can write this one S double hat minus B plus B minus S hat and S double hat minus S. It's clear that these two inner products are equal.
So I can rewrite these in the following form. The inner product of S double hat minus V and S double hat minus S hat plus the inner product of V minus S hat and S double hat minus S hat. So we say that V minus S hat is will hat of S. Since S double hat minus S hat belongs to S, because again, any two vectors, the combination belongs to the same vector space. S double hat minus S hat belongs to S, then V minus S hat and the inner product of V minus S hat and S hat minus S hat is double hat minus S hat is equal to zero. And the inner product of S double hat minus V and S double hat minus S hat is equal to zero. Why? Because we assume that V minus S hat is orthogonal to S, means that it's orthogonal to any every element in S. And V minus S double hat is also power to S. V minus S hat, S hat minus V comes from. Thus, S hat minus S, the norm of S hat, S double hat minus S hat square is zero. What does it mean? We know that norm is zero only when the vector is a zero vector. So it means that S double hat minus S hat is equal to zero or S double hat is equal to S hat. So this completes our. So it says that it's unique. You have only one S hat. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. How do you know that the double hat minus V belongs to this cell? Here. Yeah. Yeah. Other side. When you're doing your diagonal, the other. So your question is about this one, yeah? But I don't think that's more the orthogonality. So that's that. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. So it's it's about here. Do you agree that? If we pick any two elements from vector space, their combination, any combination, also belongs to that vector space. Right. So we know that S double hat minus S hat belongs to S. Here, we just prove that when S hat and S double hat are optimal, it means that V minus S hat should be orthogonal to S, and V minus, v minus S double hat should be orthogonal to S. So it means that it's orthogonal to any element. And then we say it's orthogonal, the inner product is equal to zero. So, got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay, so V minus S hat is orthogonal to S, it's orthogonal to any element in S, the inner product is equal to zero. V minus S double hat is also orthogonal, and this is just a, just a negative of that. It's also orthogonal to S double hat minus S hat. So it means that the inner product is also equal to zero. So one zero plus two zero, so it means that this is it. V minus S hat. That's not in V necessarily, right? In V? Yeah. If, if, uh, let, let me see the, just. Oh, so you say that V is from V. The vector space V and S hat is from the vector space S. So they are from two, two different vector spaces. So we cannot say anything about that. If S hat belongs to the intersection of the vector space V and S, then you can say something. You can say that this also belongs to the vector space V. But here, this is from one vector space, this is from the other vector space. So just remember the geometric interpretation that we had last time. This is S and this is V. 
So you see that this is the vector, vector space S. You mean that any vector in this form, you, know, you can take just one unitary vector and these are just escaping of that. And this is B. Definitely B doesn't belong to S. So B minus S hat doesn't belong to, to, to S, near to, to B, to the capital B, to the vector space B. Okay, so it was for the first part, part A. Now, if there is no question, we will proceed with part B. No question? So now we start with part B. But part B says that suppose S is complete, then the optimization problem is solvable. So our hypothesis is that S is complete. We are going to, we are going to use that, that property. And the goal is just to say that it's solvable. I mean, the infimum is achievable. We can achieve the infimum. Let S be complete. Define comma equal to B comma non B minus S. For all S that belong to the vector space S. We have to establish that the income. Or there exists, there exists a vector like a circle here that belongs to S such that. So I assume that this is complete and I define the intermodal for gamma and I have to show that we can find gamma. So it means that there is a vector like a circle that belongs to S because our search domain is a subspace S such that the norm is equal to gamma. So I should prove that we can find that as a circle.
it's clear from the definition of comma that for any S belonging to a subspace S, the norm B minus S is greater than God. So when I say that this a circle gives me gamma and gamma is infinite, it means that for any other vector from that vector space, the norm should be greater than gamma. Otherwise, it's not optimal anymore. Here I say that a circle is the optimal. Also, there exists there exists the sequence of vectors. My hypothesis is that S is complete, and since completeness, you now it uh, has a inside the completeness we have also Cauchy sequence. So we are expecting to use kind of sequence of vectors. So also there exists a sequence of vectors, S, K, that belong to the vector space S such that the limit of the norm B minus S, K as K goes to infinity is gone. So it's a vector, it's a sequence of vectors. And as k goes to infinity, e sequence converges to a circle. So that that really holds. Now, using the parallelogram, no. What's the parallelogram of flow? No. Any idea? So, assume we have a vector in this form, A, and another vector, B. So, what's the sum? This is going to be the sum. So A plus B. And this is going to be the sequence. This is sum A plus B, and this is the minus A minus B. So, the parallelogram below says that the norm of A plus B squared plus A minus B squared is equal to two times the norm of A squared plus two times the norm of B squared. So I, I can 
couldn't just change the camera and backwards, but yeah, people can easily just go with the other end or the other angle and they can understand what it's doing. So using this law, it gives us SI minus B plus B minus SJ. SI and SJ are any two random uh, random elements from this sequence. The square plus SI minus B minus B minus SJ again the square is equal to is equal to two times SI minus B square plus two times B minus SJ square. Where SI and SJ are two elements. The sequence SJ that belong to S. So it means that S and SJ also belong to S. Okay, we have this equality. This equality can be rearranged to the following form H the wrong equality. I mean that one can be rearranged to give S I first I write, then I will explain. S I minus S J, the norm is square, is equal to two times S I minus V square plus two times S J minus V square minus four times B minus S I plus sj over two is square. So here, let me use that Here, this is si minus v minus v plus So sorry, it's a problem. Oh, yeah, that was correct. So the first one is SI minus V plus V minus SJ. And this one is SI minus V minus V plus SJ. So here, minus V plus V, uh, positive V, negative V. They cancel each other. So it's SI minus SJ, the norm is square there. And this one is SI plus SJ minus 2B. It can be rewritten in this form two times 
SI minus F plus SJ over two minus G. So I'm going to, to replace this with this one and the rest are the same. So the first term here, the first term on the right side, the second term on the right side, and I'm going to move this term from the left side to the right side, then I have a negative sign. I have two here, which is the square, gives me four, and the norm V minus SI plus SJ over two, and we know that by the way, the norm of, in general, A minus B squared is equal to the norm of B minus A squared. We have this problem, and AB can be any vector. It's just like the absolute value. So here I just say minus four times V minus SI plus SJ over two, and the rest are the same. So our sequence, in our sequence, it said that this sequence converges to S, a circle. And we define gamma as the limit of V minus S K as K goes to infinity. So look, here we have V minus a term, and if we consider this, when i and j goes to infinity, so it gives me So I say that as k goes to infinity, this converges to gamma, and it's the sequence. So the sequence converges. So it means that any vector, not necessarily k goes to infinity, is greater than that gamma. So when I take the, the negative one, it gives me this in positive sign. Is it clear? So I have this. So it means that V minus S, S I or any I, this is always greater than greater or equal to gamma. Why? Because it will, it converges to gamma. It's a sequence, it converges to gamma. So any vector, not in the limit is greater than the, uh, the, the, the limit value. When I have a negative sign, it says that minus B minus S I is the standard order minus gamma. So I have minus four times V minus, is this S I here is actually S I plus S J over two. So I have a four here. So four comes here as well. So this is lower than, lower or equal to minus four comma S squared. Yes, any questions? Then using the fact that the limit when k goes to infinity or the is the scale is gone. We get 
now I can take the limit from, from both flags. The limit when k goes to infinity, the limit of SI minus S j squared is lower than the limit of two SI minus V squared k goes to infinity plus two log of S j minus V squared minus four comma squared which is lower than two comma squared I just replace it plus two comma squared minus four comma squared which is these forces limit of S i minus S j as k goes to infinity. Look, here we have S i and S j, so and we say k goes to infinity. But since actually we don't have k, I can in some books you can see you, you may see that they draw this limit sign. They say that the norm is equal to zero plus the sequence of vectors the sequence of vectors is k along with s is tau. Since s is complete, Are sure that these sequence converges to a vector S that one to S. Finally, using the limit of norms, the norm of V minus S circle is equal to the norm of V minus S K as k goes to infinity, which we define to be gamma, and this completes the vector. By the way, last time we were talking about how she sequence. And there was a question that how she sequence that doesn't converge. And did you get a chance to think about it? The Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge. We were supposed to put it in the homework, but then we modified the homework. So the Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge. No idea. One example that people usually give in the course is pi. So you can assume a, se a sequence in this form. So you have the first element 
which is x1 for instance, is 3.1. The second element is 3.14. So it's the pi, but in each element, in the first element, you consider only the first decimal, and the second one, you consider two decimals. And x3 will be 3.141, so this is a Cauchy sequence because for any epsilon that is positive, you can find a number, a, a theta, such that the difference between x, t, and x, s is greater than epsilon for any theta uh, greater than. You can find you can find uh, there exists a pattern such that P and S are greater than sorry. Yes, yes, yes you are less lower than epsilon. So here it's clear that whatever epsilon you give is very small or big, whatever. I can't find this because the difference between the elements, as we go further, the difference between the elements can be arbitrary. But this sequence belongs to the rational numbers. This belongs to the rational numbers, but it converges to pi at the end the limit of xk as k goes to infinity is pi. And we know that pi is an irrational number. It means that you cannot put in the form of a nominator. So this is a sequence, a Cauchy sequence, but it doesn't converge. On rational level, it converges to a number, but it's not on the rational. Domain. So, if we define this sequence on a rational domain, it's a Cauchy sequence, but it doesn't converge. It doesn't converge on the same domain. Okay, any questions? I'd like to also do. Finish the proof. We have ten minutes, so it's very interesting. Yes, go ahead. Oh, it was again, uh, what's the definition of uh, oh, complete? I think so you mean the, the mathematical definition or just uh, so the definition is that every Cauchy sequence, when we say a subspace is complete, it means that every Cauchy sequence defined on that subspace converges. To, to something that belongs to the same subspace. So it's a balanced space. It's kind of one up space, yes. Okay, so the final part of the theorem, part C. I'd like to finish the third today, and then on Monday you can see some, some examples for the third. Part C. So it says that S is finite dimensional. We have B, a set of vectors that are basis for S, and we define the matrix M in the following form. First, M is not singular. So the first, Show that we first show that M is non singular. Again, we lose the proof by by contradiction method. Suppose not. Then there exists, there exists a vector 
like on plot that is not zero and belongs to Cn such that m alpha is equal to zero. So when we say a matrix is singular, it means that its null space is empty or trivial. And I think you have seen the definition of the null space in one of you, one of your homeworks. So the null space of M, you just solve this equation here, the system of uh, equations here. And if alpha is the zero vector, it means that its uh, null space is trivial. If alpha is not a zero vector, it means that this null space is not trivial. In that case, M is not singular, or the determinant is equal to zero. Or is uh, it's not invertible? This implies that I have this. Let's just multiply both lines by alpha star. Alpha star is alpha transpose conjugate because we are in the complex domain. But when it's a real numbers, this will be just a transfer, it will be T. This, if you expand this alpha, it will be in this way. I sum from I equal to one to N, the sum over J from one to N, alpha I bar, the inner product of BI and BI, Sorry, this is the new J. Alpha J. I just use that M given there. I put it here. Alpha is a vector. So alpha I is the ith element of that vector. And I just write it in this form. As again, I keep the left side, and this can be rewritten in this one the inner product of Q and Q, which is the norm of Q squared, where Q is defined as. The sum over i from one to n alpha i to b i. It can be rewritten in this one. So when I say the norm is equal to zero, it means that q is equal to zero. This as a sequence or as a result. Result Q is equal to zero, which means that the sum from I one of R B I is equal to zero. This is the double star equation. Again, we will use this equation, we will refer to it in this equation later on. And whenever I say an equation double star. Question. Any questions? However, because B, which is B one. B2 and BN is a basis. It is literally independent.
So first, we say that this is a basis, it is, this is our hypothesis, and then we prove that there exists a linear combination. Alpha i is not zero because I proved that it's not a zero vector. So it means that alpha i, one or two or three of them can be zero, but not all of them. We prove that this is equal to zero. So on the one hand, these are linearly independent. On the second hand, we find alpha i, non zero alpha i's, that uh, gives us the equation that two is double star. So these contradicts double star proving M is massive or reversible. So if you have just five minutes, I'd like to finish the proof. Then on Monday, we can just go with the examples. Is it fine? Okay, thank you. Next, since S is finite dimensional, it is complete. We had a third and saying that any finite dimensional subspace is complete. Then it is clear from part B that the optimization problem is star is solvable. Look at part B, it says that when S is complete, then the star is solvable. So we just use the part B. Since B is a basis for S. We can write the optimal vector. What's our optimal vector? It's a sad that going into S as the linear combination, as the following linear combination. S hat is J from one and alpha J in J. Clear? From part A, a unique optimal vector. As had must satisfy B minus S hat should be on count of S or equivalently. Inner product of E R and B minus S hat should be equal to zero for for I from one to n. E is a basis. When I say that B minus S hat should be orthogonal, it means that it should be orthogonal. The basis as well. So the inner product between the i and the minus s hat should be equal to zero for i from one to n. Oh, we have another. Great. 
regarding this, gives the inner product of P1, P i, and P. So when I say the inner product of P i and P minus s hat is equal to zero, this means that the inner product of P i and P minus the inner product of P i and s hat is equal to zero. So these two are equal. So this means that the inner product of P i and P is equal to, I just replaced the s hat that I had there. The inner product of P i and P is equal to J from one to n, the inner product of P r and P j times alpha j. I just replace the definition I had for this hat there. Stacking up these equations. Because this is for i from 1 to n. So I have n equations here. Second of these equations yields in your product pn and p is equal to m alpha or and m if I just say, or alpha is equal to m minus one, p one and p, m and p. This one bleeds. Sorry for keeping you an extra five minutes, but now we, we completed the proof. I'm going to upload my notes uh, today, just after this meeting. I'm going to upload my notes. So and please feel free if, if there is any question, feel free to ask the question. And you can, you can ask your questions on Monday and ask the next Monday. Then I will find the problem. So in part C, the hypothesis was that S is finite dimensional, B is a basis, M is in this form, and S hat, which is the optimal solution, is in this form where alpha depends on alpha as a So for the first part, we prove that M is non singular. When we say M is non singular, it means that it's invertible. We can find the states uh, the inverse of M. Then we consider a structure for this hat in this form, and we reach this that alpha should satisfy this. So the structure for this hat is in this form, and alpha you can see is just the same. So this completes the any questions? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you have a question? No, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.